my name is Christina Ashana. I'm a UC President's Postdoctoral Fellow in the Department of Sociology at UC Santa Barbara in California. Uh, I'm a performance ethnographer and a cultural anthropologist of policing and police training. Well, thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to be talking about your um, article from 2021 called Inescapable Scripts, Role-Playing Feminist Revisions and Rehearsing Racialized State Violence in Police Training Scenarios. So if you could uh, just kind of get us started with how you came to uh, this article and then how you also kind of came to, you know, participating in these scenario trainings. Yes. So, yeah, of course. So uh, I came to writing this article um, after doing ethnographic research with police officers in East County, San Diego for five years. Um, and sort of got an in uh, into that department as uh, an ethnographer, as a grad student. Uh, and so I had spent a lot of time with officers at various levels uh, from, you know, sort of more junior officers who are just sort of starting their what's called like a probationary period, which means, you know, you've just graduated the police academy uh, and now you're going to spend the next couple of months kind of like shadowing a more veteran or senior officer. So I spent time with, you know, those sorts of officers who had just graduated the academy, but also officers who, you know, were more veteran and senior who had worked, you know, somewhere between like six, you know, been on the field um, as an officer between six and like 14 years. And so in doing that work, I, you know, I, I did ride alongs with them. So I'm like literally sitting in the passenger seat next to these officers on patrol at various times of the day. And, you know, as we were moving through the street, you know, rolling down the street together in the patrol car, I started to wonder, you know, as I would watch officers pull people over uh, and, you know, engage in these, you know, traffic stops is one example or a vehicle stop. I started to wonder how it how was it that these officers started to, in conversation, create the kinds of situations that they actually wanted to police, which sounds a little abstract, but hopefully we can we'll make that a little bit more specific when we talk a little bit more about the article. Um, and so, you know, I had this opportunity because I wondered how is it that, you know, we're here in the field together, the patrol field, but these officers would keep remarking on their training. And it's not, you know, it's not a strange thing for, of course, an, you know, anyone in a in a professional field to be like, oh, like there was a training period that brought me to see my my the work that I do in a certain way. Right. Um, and yet, you know, there was this whole other space, this training academy that I had not spent as much time in. So I had the opportunity after sort of meeting these other officers and, and you know, and other ethnographers of policing might tell you that. Um, part of, I think, the work uh, of being an ethnographer who works um, on policing uh, does involve a kind of like rapport building. So it's kind of like once you're thought of as not uh, not as a threat or as someone who's more familiar, then it seems like some of those other spaces are more available to you. So I was invited um, to be a role player at this police academy, which is basically... Uh, we, we can talk more at length about it, but basically I was invited to go and perform as an actor alongside other actors in the academy. And so that was sort of my uh, movement to from the patrol field to the academy. But the thing I want to also say is that in addition to sort of my more formal training as like a media studies and cultural anthro scholar, is that I also have a performance background uh, and not so much like classic theater, <laughs> but more experimental performance making. Um, at UC San Diego, there's an incredible tradition there of like performance artist making um, and doing. Uh, and one of my mentors is Ricardo Dominguez at UCSD. And so all to say that I brought that, the kind of mandate to perform, to like, to risk uh, co-presence with police in a like highly constrained emotional, um, you know, environment like that. Like I, I feel that very strongly as a performer and I, and I, and, and I take that very seriously also as a research method. Well, and that brings up uh, kind of an interesting point, but I want to first have you kind of describe for us what the training, what this role playing was actually, and who did it? Was it other actors like you, people from the community, police officers? What was kind of the setup? And then, then maybe talk about how you fit into it. Sure, absolutely. So so I'm going to speak specifically to uh, California's uh, Police Academy training because I'm more familiar. Um, so 
when you enroll to be a police cadet, right? You can, if you want to be a police officer, there are two avenues to do this. I'll kind of like mark the, the, the trajectory and then how you end up at the academy. So you can either apply with the local department and then that department will, will basically sponsor you and they'll pay for your training. Or if you have not had, you know, if, if you have not had like success, I guess, you know, um, being hired by a department in advance, you can just pay your own way. So you pay out of pocket, a couple grand, uh, more than a couple grand to, to join the academy. So you're already there. So when you're there, you're doing six months of training. And along the way, you're doing, you know, um, different kinds of, you know, you're doing like hands-on training, combat training, you're doing a lot of physical testing. Um, and you're also like being exposed to like different kinds of media formations. You're looking at video together. You're learning how to see video, how to uh, listen to like different kinds of uh, 911 response calls. And you're being primed to anticipate and experience yourself as someone who was about to enter a very dangerous field, the, the patrol field, right, writ large. So the way that the uh, the California uh, Peace Officer Standards and Training Post is the organizational body in Sacramento, the way that they deal with how can we now test the six months of training is they have a an event called Scenario Test Week. And what that is, is it's uh, five days, like nine to five, five days of, of training and testing. What's more, the testing. And it's the final 40 hours of the academy. And it is, in my estimation, um, a kind of theater event. Because what is happening is you have, per academy, you have what's called a scenario manager. And their job is they have to pick 14 kinds of scenarios that approximate a kind of real world encounter that uh, a, an officer should be ready to experience, like needs to be like ready to um, enter into that experience and know what to do. So in California, there are four, uh, according to Post, California's organizational police regulation body, there are 14 kinds of scenarios that cadets need to be trained and tested in. So the scenario manager has to now pick 14 scenarios, which are basically little theater scripts. They're kind of like they're they're texts that are a kind of imagined scenario that that a cop could come across and they have to figure out what to do in that scene. So the scenario manager uh, of the academy will pick 14. They'll get them from post. And so in effect, they're almost like a theater dramaturg, right? They're, they're like in charge of, okay, here are all of the texts we need to stage. So the uh, scenario test week ends up being a very uh, kind of intense uh, organizational kind of nightmare to figure out how do we get this many hundreds of recruits through 14 scenes in five days, <laughs> you know, um, and you each of those recruits or cadets has to go through that scene one at a time. And they're not supposed to know what the scene is about in advance because that kind of defeats the kind of imaginary purpose of pretending that this is real life, right? You're, you're basically, it's a simulation of a real world encounter. And so all to say that that's uh, a very complicated task organizationally to figure out, okay, I've got this many recruits. I have five days, I have 40 hours. How many actors do I need? per scene, per scenario. And other training facilities like Quantico, uh, the FBI's Quantico uh, base, or uh, there are other training facilities for like the federal military uh, that, you know, most famous, I think is like virtual Iraq um, in, in the Mojave Desert. The academy that I went to and in general in California, these academies don't use professional actors. Uh, they don't contract out with, you know, different companies to get actors to act in these scenes. What they do is they hire, or, I mean, they basically get patrol officers to act. And what I found when I was doing this work, uh, as in I was there, like, you know, observing these scenes, like empirically in the world with them in the same room, was that that makes 
a pedagogical difference in how the recruits learn. What is it about this scene I'm in that I need to pay attention to or what do I need to ignore? And that gets enforced in the room in a way that you can't really see if you're not in the room with these officers. So the actors are... 90% of them are patrol officers who are getting paid overtime. And they're like, yes, I would love to not be on patrol today and like do all this paperwork while I'm driving around. It's a lot of work. It's like, oh, I get to come for a couple of days and yell at some recruits. I get to act. I get to bring my lived experience to bear upon, you know, these, you know, impressionable recruits. Yeah. Like I want to teach them, you know, excuse my French, what they have called like the real shit of policing, right? Not something that is what what they imagine is a kind of um, very uh, kind of not realistic and idealistic form of, of police knowledge. They're like, let's teach them from the street. So I found myself there as a volunteer, I I had the sort of, uh, I could sort of say, you know, I have experience with police and they were like, great, we need people. So (laughs) do you want to do this? Great. (laughs) And I was like, okay. (laughs) And so in addition to people like me who are not, you know, uh, LEOs or, you know, law enforcement officers, the other people who are there are also kind of uh, what you could think of as like trusted individuals. So that includes, uh, the children of officers um, or, you know, people like uh, students who are being given like extra credit by their professor at a community college because that professor is friends with a police officer. And they're like, hey, I've got criminal justice students. They want extra credit. Can they come and role play? So I, I want to say, I want to mention that because there's a way in which I, I get this question a lot, which is like, how did you get access to this space um, that is like highly constrained and often imagined as like inaccessible to the average person? Um, and yet there are these ways that people come to be in that world, in that training world that makes a material difference in how these recruits learn uh and, and are tested out of the academy and, and may potentially bring what they learn into the field with very, um, you know, real material consequences, as I write in my article. Yeah, and I thank you for that. And I think the um, it's incredibly interesting that you got to do it. You're, you're right. And I think one of the things that I'd love for you to kind of talk to us next about is um, how many times you were shot in the deadly force training and then um what you think that proved not proved to you but what did you learn from being in that specific s- scenario because you kind of mentioned this feedback loop mm-hmm. you know, kind of how bringing the real shit is on one hand you want it, it seems like common sense is like well you want people who do the job to do the training but I think you discovered something about that whole idea that you kind of challenge. So if you could uh, talk to us about that. Right. So, yeah. So one of these 14 scenarios that uh, recruits have to be trained and tested in is called deadly use of force. And uh, the, the idea there in the scenario is that you want officers to know when they are able to legally use deadly use of force. So in this scene that we staged together, so it was me and another officer uh, um, in a a department somewhere in Southern California. (laughs) Uh, So this all, you know, so basically him and I are the actors and we are taking turns. Um, so basically it's like he, he sits, you know, when, when I'm role playing, he's sitting in the corner and then, you know, when the new recruit comes in, he's like, okay, it's my turn. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to like now be this, I'm going to act this role. And the role that is given to you as the actor is in, in, and it's, it's the one that I write about in the article is you are a disturbed individual. (laughs) That's literally the category and you've been fired from your job. You're very upset and you refuse to leave your work because you refuse to leave your work. 
Uh, the assumption here is that someone calls security or they call the boss and someone calls the police and says, hey, I have an, uh, you know, someone got fired, they're upset and they're refusing to leave work. And the only tool or rather the only prop that you are given as the actor is you're given a decommissioned pistol. And you are sort of uh, encouraged to hide that pistol so you want to conceal it in, as the actor. So usually, you know, you can either put it like in your front waistband or like I put it like, you know, behind so that it's not visible to the recruit right away. And during the scene, there is the evaluator. So this is like a training officer whose job is to stand in the corner. They have a clipboard and they are now you know, they, they are calling the recruit in and saying, you know, and basically the other thing I want to mention, which is really interesting is that the evaluator who is the training officer is also at the same time that they are evaluating, they are acting, <laughs> they are become, they are acting all of the roles improvisationally that are needed to get that recruit in the room. So for example, if I'm the actor and I'm standing over here and I'm a disturbed individual, and I you know, and I'm like crying, I'm sort of ranting about the fact that I got fired. The recruit is outside of the hallway because I'm in a room. They're outside of the hallway. They're supposed to hear me, you know, being disturbed, however the actor interprets that. <laughs> and the recruit will, you know, basically role play that they're talking to dispatch. And they'll, you know, they have their like their shoulder mounted radios on their on their lapel and they'll say, you know, they'll start to pretend to talk to dispatch to get information, right? Like I need backup or, um, you know, do I have any other information before I walk into this room? And the evaluator with the clipboard is like, no, there's no backup. So they're they're basically forcing in improvisationally in real time the kind of imaginary constraints that are going to push that recruit into the room and be forced to deal with it themselves. So, you know, when that recruit comes into the room, they're supposed to see someone being disturbed and their job is to, you know, if they can get the person to comply, meaning the actor, then that's fine. And you would think, um, or one or one might imagine, okay, well, wouldn't the goal of this scenario be to get this person to calm down, maybe get them to start talking, and then potentially, or you know, arrest them peacefully, basically without incident? But what I found is that the moment that any recruit sees the gun, right, they are. Not not just like, you know, suggested to shoot, but like they are mandated to shoot. <laughs> so what happens is, you know, usually in, you know, in this scenario, like when I was watching this other actor who's an officer, you know, he would pull out the gun and he would, you know, he, he'd start like, you know, basically he, he he wouldn't comply and neither would I. So they, they the uh, recruit would walk in and say like, hey, I heard there's a disturbance. Can you please tell me your name? Uh, will you stand up for me? Or uh, will you like stop moving? Or, you know, depending on what the actor's doing, maybe I'm walking around and I'm like, no, no, you know, I'm like not complying. I'm not telling the person my name. I'm I'm crying. I'm screaming. I'm, I'm doing whatever I'm doing as the actor, right? But eventually, you know, as the actor, and I can speak for me personally, I'm looking over in the uh, uh, to the evaluator because I've, I've got, you know, I know I've got the gun in my waistband and I'm kind of looking at them like, when do you want me to reveal this gun, right? Because obviously we have to go through another hundred recruits so that we can't, you know, have this be an extended seat, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I'll pull out the gun and I'll point it down on purpose because I'm trying to show I'm not raising it at, at this recruit, right? But in general, once you pull that weapon, every single recruit should shoot. And any time any recruit hesitated, kept talking, uh, you know, to like distract me or in, in one in one case, uh, one of the recruits runs out of the room when this when the other actor pulls the gun. Anytime something happens that isn't literally bring, you know, they they have their uh, their blue safety training pistols, which are just a model, right? They're they're not they don't fire anything. But if they don't pull that out and 
you know, go bang, which is what they do. They're like, bang, I shoot you. <laughs> then they then they are chastised. They are like made to they they are they are, you know, uh punished in real time for not doing that. And so, you know, even if someone takes too long, they'd be like, the, the evaluator in the corner is like, stop, what are you doing? This is embarrassing. You're gonna let this person draw a gun like on you. Of course, it doesn't matter that I'm not aiming the gun at someone. All that matters is that this recruit has failed already to fire fast, ask questions later kind of thing. And so the recruit who's now being chastised, who's already nervous because they don't want to fail the academy. They want to like graduate on Sunday, you know, the following weekend is like, do it again. That's embarrassing. Like if you do that in the field, you're going to get shot. You do that in the field, your, your, you know, your uh, partner gets shot. That's on you. You're going to go tell their family. It's, it's your fault that, that they're dead. And so they're like, okay, okay. And then they do it again. And I'm like, so they do the scenario again and I'm just talking. And before I've even touched the gun, they're like, you're dead. And they're like, good job. Okay, great. Uh, I need you to practice that 15 more times until you pull that gun so goddamn fast. There's no friction between the holster and your hand. Do you understand? And they're like, yes, ma'am. And they run out of the room. And there is only one time I write in the article where I am not shot as the actor. And for some reason, like, cause I, at some point, like in, I think I'm like 20 recruits in at that point where there's sort of like a, a lull between recruits. You get, you get like five minutes to like <laughs> wipe off the sweat and do like have a sip of coffee <laughs> and be like, okay, okay, calm down, calm down. I got to do this again. <laughs> and at some point I, you know, I'm asking the evaluator, I'm like, do, like how quickly do I, do I want them to shoot me? Like every time <laughs> or like, is there any possibility that do you want me to try and get them to not shoot me? So to deescalate and, she, and this evaluator is like, this isn't even a complicated concept. Like, sure, if they don't shoot you, like, I guess that's fine. But all I want them to be able to say when they're standing in front of a judge is I used deadly force because I feared for my life, period, <laughs> you know, and so. I'm realizing as I'm in the scenario, I'm like, there, this is not, you know, de-escalation training, obviously. Um, and the practical work of getting these recruits through this scenario means we don't have 20 minutes to do a like long extended performance in which we like carry the recruit through all the possibilities of what could happen. Because it's like we have to get through so many. And then also they are trying to recreate. Uh, a kind of felicitous representation of what they think real policing is, which is that things happen in an instant. Are you going to live or die? And so that really shapes the training, right? So again, I'm just re all to say that the one time I am not shot in the scenario, you know, this officer or re recruit playing an officer comes in and in this, in this room, there are like pillars basically it's it's like a huge uh um like classroom and the officer comes in he's trying to talk to me and I'm like no no I'm not going to tell you my name I'm I'm like resisting I'm resisting everything I'm not complying but I, I haven't pulled the gun yet and eventually you know I pull the gun and and I you know I am like I'm crying I'm, I'm hysterical I start to like say that you know I've been fired and like, how am I going to take care of my kids? How am I going to take, and, and I'm like, I'm crying like real tears as an actor. And I'm, I'm fully in that moment. I'm inhabiting, you know, and, and I can talk a little bit about what it is that I think I'm inhabiting in a moment <laughs> when I'm acting. And I, you know, but I'll just say I'm crying, but I pull the gun and I'm aiming it down. And this officer takes cover behind one of these pillars and we have a conversation and he's like, and I'm like, I don't want to die. I'm like crying. I'm like, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And I am like feeling that mandate with every ounce of my being, like begging for my life. And he's like, you don't it, like, no one has to die. No one has to die. Like, just put the gun down. Like, you'll go home to your kids. I promise you. I promise, you know, and, and like, in some way, I'm like, in my head, I'm like, God, oh, this guy's like a really good actor. <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, but I, I like, 
something. I, I'm trying, you know, I, I try to like think, think through that a little bit of like, what is it that compelled me? You know, because I obviously don't want to be like, got to like, gotcha. And like shoot him anyway, but something compels me as he's talking to me, the character that I'm playing and I put the gun down and he's like, great. You put the, he's like, that's good. That's good. He's like, just take two steps forward. He comes up behind me and he like, you know, he grabs my hands and he cuffs me and, you know, without incident, essentially. And, and he like pushes the, the gun away from me. And I'm sitting there like tears streaming down my face, facing the wall, like handcuffed, kind of just waiting. And the evaluator is like, OK, great. That was good. Yeah. OK. So like, yeah, you you like, you know, you took cover. That was great. OK, great. yeah, good. Like, r- like run along, you know. <laughs> And, the, you know, this person is like uncuffs me and is like, and, and usually most people are like, like, thank you for your, for your, not like for your service. But that's kind of what, what they say. They're like, hey, thank you. You know, and I'm like, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> so, yeah, I, maybe we can talk like a little bit about like those, eth- what I mean by ethnographic feedback loops, but I just wanted to kind of give a sense of a scene not not just because you know it, it's a great story, <laughs> but because that scene building, feeling that that emotional weight, is what the recruits are asked to do, and they're asked to like feel that weight, to feel that um, that um, high octane energy. But their their sort of mandate is to like, okay, you're in it, but also you can't get distracted. You can't cry. You can't run out of the room. You can't say you're scared. You can't say time out. <laughs> I don't want to do this. Let's do it again. Right. So, yeah. Well, and I think that, yeah, if you would talk more about like how you perceived and how you embodied the role and then yeah. kind of what the police are also being taught to embody, because I think there are two different um, ways mm-hmm. of approaching the script, as you would call it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, in the kind of formal training and in, in the sort of like a uh, popular narrative, practical narrative that gets employed at the academy, meaning what is it the training officers are constantly enforcing for the recruits? What is constantly enforced as the normative performance of what you need to embody as an officer is a kind of normatively masculine presence, right? A kind of aggressive masculinity, completely tacitly like this is not something you put on this is something that you already embody as like the the code it doesn't matter what race you are it doesn't matter what gender you are and you know there there have been uh really great um articles written about how is it that even a highly more diverse police recruit body uh is still uh taught to like eschew their their own ethnocultural diversities in favor of taking on a kind of flattened, uh, you know, tacit white masculinity. Uh, one of those people is uh, Dr. Aisha Belizo de Jesus, who has this amazing article called The Jungle Academy, in which she talks about that. How is it that officers and, and, and recruits are trained to take on this kind of normative white tacit masculinity that they have to perform whether they are you know uh black or brown or whether they are like you know femme presenting is irrelevant they have to take this on this white masculinity is the role that they have to play that that flattens out all of the diversity between the recruits and so that repertoire that kind of enact that that enacting of that aggressive white masculinity is the is is the genre in which these recruits have to perform. And like one of the ways that they do that, one of those techniques is displaying what's called command presence. Command presence is the ability to walk into a room. It's the way that you stand. It's the way that you hold your body. It's the way that you put your hands on your hips and like 
you know, with one hand on your weapon to kind of show, yes, I could pull my gun at any moment. I have complete control over all of the tools on my belt. I know where they are. I know how they're placed in relation to each other in relation to the way that I'm standing opposite from this person that I'm talking to who's not an officer, right? It's the ability to walk into a room and to get people to comply with you in such a way that you are in control of a scene, you're always, as a recruit, trying to get control of any situation because the idea is that as long as you have control, things can stop spiraling toward violence. Of course, the irony there <laughs> is that to, uh, to perform that command presence, officers are tacitly reproducing the violence that they, that they claim and seek to not uh, um, have to deal with in the field as as a kind of you know well I'm a, I'm a safety uh, you know I, I'm a public safety servant of course I'm I'm trying to fight violence <laughs> and yet in effect when when you're in a scene as a recruit and there's someone who's not complying with you they're walking around they're crying they're not giving you their name there is really no space for that officer to take a step back, metaphorically speaking, and slow down the pace of, of action, <laughs> if you will, right? The mandate is not to slow down, but to like ramp up to getting control so that you, so, so that you know this person can't shoot me. Why? Because I've already shot them. So. I have gotten control of the situation. And I mean, I'm saying that kind of cavalier because when you're in it and you experience it, you're like, wow, this is really how it happens. But I don't mean to sound so cavalier. It's just, it's kind of incredible. Uh, because it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> when you're in it, you're like, you've just, I mean, yes, you've shot the person with the gun, but that didn't decrease any violence, you know, now someone is dying or dead, you know. Um, and of course, like when, when you are shot as the actor, there really isn't a kind of scene that happens afterward that's like, I check for their pulse, I stop the bleeding, I do this. <laughs> They're like, okay, uh, like I, I like call 911 or whatever. They're like, great, you know, and then they like leave the room, they, they go to another scenario and you're like, okay. So, there is a kind, so I'm, I'm saying all this because that's that command presence, that performance of also what is called officer safety, that is the primary mandate that is taught in police academies. Your job is to perform officer safety. You only do things, you, you are really, officer safety is not just about, I, you know, I do whatever I need to do to keep myself safe to go home at night. It's about... It's it's an, an entire kind of ideological paradigm in which even as you do things to protect yourself uh, as the officer that ends up, you know, hurting like, like a suspect or just a person who's not an officer, that narrative still, even as that person is hurt, you're like, no, this is still officer safety because that person could have gone on and done X, Y, and Z. And therefore, officer safety has been achieved because I am safe. That person is dead and they can't hurt anybody else or they're injured so badly, it, you know, fill in the blank. <laughs> and, you know, that framework is like hermeneticly sealed. It's like so tightly, um, they're really, it feels like when you're in uh, a scene with officers and you're acting, it feels like that mandate, that officer safety framework is so it's the thing that encompasses everything and so all to say that that's the kind of ideological model but in practice and this is what I found when I was doing this ethnographic work was that the training models and paradigms that sort of come top down from post they are they are designed with a kind of like ideological emphasis on these concepts, command presence, office, officer safety, et cetera. But what happens in the actual training room in these like tiny little theaters that are not visible to a lot of people except three people, 
two or four, two actors, an evaluator, and a recruit. <laughs> What's happening there is much more complicated and much more nuanced than I think a lot of work uh, sort of scholarly uh, and journalistic work around training can really get at. Because when you're in the room, what you see, what you can see is the way in which officers themselves, like, like the actors, openly denigrate the training. And they're like, this training is not real. <laughs> it's not real enough. You would never say it like that. You would never act it like that. And so as the actors, they take this as an opportunity to kind of do a corrective to what they see as bullshit academy training that's not real enough. And so as I'm sitting there as the actor, like in the corner, like I'm I'm like taking a break for five minutes and I'm watching an officer who's turned actor role play. They'll turn to me and be like, oh yeah, there was this, you know, this black guy that I... uh stopped like you know last week at a 7-eleven he was acting like this he was you know you know he, he starts to like re-perform this guy that he had interacted with and he's like oh god like this guy like smelled he was like homeless you know um i'm gonna give them the real shit the next recruit that walks in here that recruit's gonna encounter this guy and then the officer actor when the recruit walks in and starts to perform this scene from his own patrol experience. And in, you know, and, and I want to say like that this officer is, is white, you know? So here's a white officer who's like kind of doing a minstrel blackface performance of this person at a 7-Eleven <laughs> that he encountered in order to get the recruit to shoot him faster. That is, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> here are these actors who are officers and they are bringing into the academy site their own lived experience to get the recruits to move quickly toward the right course of action. And as they're doing that, because they're officers, <laughs> The evaluator who is in the corner, who's also an officer, basically is is never uh, countering what, what what the officer is doing. They're like, oh yeah, that yes, yes, I co-signed that. <laughs> oh, I know that guy. Oh yeah, that that black guy. Oh, how many black guys have I run run into that do that? You know, and it's like this kind of I'm describing this experience as a kind of ethnographic feedback loop, and because it disrupts this idea about uh, the way that training operates in policing, which is that training is often like called sequentially organized. First you train, and then the next thing you do is you go to the field, because that's where the real stuff is, and you apply the training to the field experience, and good job, <laughs> sequentially. <laughs> uh, but in fact, here are these officers in the field, they're having these experiences, and the way that they are coming to terms with that experience or taking something from, from that experience is they are using it as material to stage a performance, a racial performance, a racialized fantasy about how can I get a recruit to shoot me? Oh, I know. I'm going to re-perform a homeless black man who is ranting in front of a set. I'm going to move my body like this. I'm going to do all of these sorts of like, you know, deeply racist kinds of embodied uh, actions that are going to get that recruit to immediately recognize, oh, this is someone I, I should shoot right now. That person is acting crazy. That person is not complying. That person is speaking in such a way that I'm like, I don't think I can reason with them. So I'm going to shoot them. And this is what I, and, and, and maybe you're thinking to yourself or someone who's watching this is thinking, well, okay, obviously you're going to use your lived experience. That's a very natural thing to do. <laughs> it is a natural thing to do. It's a, it's maybe a reasonable thing to do, but in the context of police training, it is deeply problematic <laughs> because what is being presented as like race neutral? Oh, these scripts don't mention race. 
We're not focused on race. Like, this is not about race or gender or ethnicity or religion or ability or disability. This is about safety. And this is about command presence. And this is about stopping an encounter from rolling out of control, which could then lead to more danger. And how do we do that? We step into a scene with command presence and we stop it in its tracks. And that's and that way we make sure that nobody gets hurt. But what is actually happening is that this race neutral, race blind training is being imbued at the very site of training with all of these sorts of racial fantasies and imaginations about what kind of body is dangerous? What kind of embodied performance will get someone to shoot you? Because who's gonna shoot back at you? It's getting the recruits to, you know, imagine the kinds of people that are going to come after them in the field. And of course that's happening all across academy training because as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that recruits do in the academy is they will listen and watch like b body cam footage and, and they will listen. I mean, this is like really disturbing. They will like, and, and it's no, it's no secret that it's disturbing because that's the point. They will get recruits to listen to 911 calls where officers didn't get there fast enough. And they listen to someone die over. They listen to children who are shot or stabbed. They look at images of like, it, it, again, it comes back to the children because it's a sort of very easy way to get them to realize the horror of policing. They're, they're always, you know, they, they are sort of constantly being confronted with all of, with, with the sort of racialized visual culture of police work, which is here are these videos of black motorists shooting you. You need to be prepared for that. You know, here is, a, you know, a Mexicano driver who is like, you know, does not comply and then shoots this person and they got away. You want that to be you as the recruit? No, you have to. So that I, I, I'm just mentioning that because that kind of racial fantasy and imagination follows them throughout the academy. But it's really at the site of scenario test week where these fantasies are returning, but through the bodies of the officers. And so then I thought to myself, oh, okay. If these officers are bringing their own lived experience to bear upon the training, well then so can the ethnographer. Because when I have been in the field with officers on patrol, we are patrolling in uh, areas where a lot of the people look like me. I'm Colombian and Assyrian, uh, and you know a lot of you know and uh, a lot of communities where I spend time with officers. Like a lot of those communities are you know Chaldean communities. They're, they're people who are basically newcomers from uh, Southwest Asian, North African, or like Middle East countries, and they are seeking asylum in the U.S. And they are experiencing policing, American policing for like the very first time as someone, as people who are sort of racialized, very similar to me. And I've had many experiences while, you know, embedded on a ride along where I'm like suddenly in this Chaldean woman's room in the middle of like a domestic violence call. And she's looking at me and she's like talking to me in Assyrian and she's in like my Assyrian's not good. Like I barely speak it, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, can't really understand her, but she's looking at me because she's rec She's having a moment of recognition. This person's not wearing a, a uniform. Like they look kind of like me. I need them to help me. Why are they here? There are, there are all of these like really complicated, you know, moments for me in my field work. But I bring that up to say that if the officers could bring their lived experiences to the training, then so could I as an actor. And so that's what I did was that I was like, you know, in, in other scenes where I don't write about this in the article, but in, in another piece um, where I'm role playing a domestic violence victim and, you know, and even in, you know, this performance, the deadly use of force, I start to kind of take on 
the performances of other women I have met in the field, you know, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm like, as I'm acting, it's not just that I'm like pulling from thin air, you know, but that I'm like, okay, who is the kind of person who's like so desperate that they're like, I'm going to return to my work the next day after I've gotten fired and I can't leave here without a job. What's going to motivate that person? What is that person going through that they are in this emotional state? They're probably not doing great, right? But this is something that the officers don't think about. They're like person with a gun. Like we're not concerned about their mental health. We're not concerned about what might motivate them to do that. But I try to push back against these scripts, these sort of idealized scripts, police training scripts by acting out an amalgamation of these women that I had met as kind of performance material to get people to like see me as a person and not as some kind of Jane Doe d- disturbed individual that, oh, like add them to the heap. Like we've got plenty, you know what I mean? Like that sounds so grotesque and horrible, but that is the truth of the way that this actually gets, you know, uh, this is how it actually unfolds in the real world, you know, it, especially in, in the way that these sorts of people who are shot by police then get talked about by the police themselves in these sort of like hidden spaces on social media, like on certain subreddits where they can like kind of do that and um, have those private conversations between themselves. So this is, this is what I mean by an ethnographic feedback loop. I am not at all saying that police are anthropologists <laughs> or ethnographers, but there is a kind of interesting parallel between what it is that the officers do uh, in in a community and what it is that the anthropologist or the ethnographer is mandated to do or is trying to do in the field, right? And when you are someone like me who has like a performance background, you you know, uh, and, and, and feels that like kind of feminist performance mandate to like take that lived experience and say, this is a way to understand what is happening in the field. It's not like an icebreaker. It's not like a cute thing I'm doing. It's a way to see something differently. Yeah, and I, I, there was a lot in there. And I think the, the thing I wanna pick out the most and maybe we can kind of wrap up on this is how do you feel that these, um, so the, the lived experience and the training create this like conversation and it continues I think after like police talk to each other constantly mm-hmm. and these are constant these modes of understanding threat are constantly being reinforced and reinvented and so it's it, it, maybe it starts in the academy but it, when you were in the ride-alongs maybe just talk briefly about how you saw this kind of dialogue continue if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it it does make sense. Yeah. So on, yeah, it's like the, I'm more concerned with like kind of showing how, or like saying, Hey, by like doing this, like performance ethnographic work, you can see how things start to iterate. And, And so like, we didn't, you know, um, I try to get at that by using the language of performance and performativity specifically, um, because both th- it, it's a layer, but both things are happening. These are performances we are doing. Like they have, it is a genre. It, it has a repertoire. It has a beginning and an end. It has intention. Like we are making a performance together, all of us, right? And we're all taking that quite seriously. Uh, at, at different levels, even if each of us as an actor has our own kind of agenda or like our own political praxis in that performance. They're performances, but they are also performative. And so here I'm referencing, of course, Judith Butler's work um, on performativity in which, you know, she, uh, they try to get at what is it how is it that certain kinds of performances and they most famously use uh, the idea of like gender performance. So like when one is doing gender, how does that 
Um, how do those gender performances? So whether you're like performing femme, so like, you know, I've got like a little eyeliner on, I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm like, my hair is dead, you know, whatever. <laughs> I've got a little lipstick on. I am doing gender, right? I am performing gender. Uh, how is it that that gender becomes recognizable? How is it that it iterates and builds over time and becomes something that can be cited? Like I'm clearly, I didn't invent this. <laughs> Look, <laughs> I, I am citing, citationally engaged in a long chain of gender performance of ideas in my mind. You know, I, I'm I'm a, I'm an embodied person in the world, and there's gender all around us, and we are taught from. When, I, mean, I don't want to make this whole thing about gender now, but I kind of have to like reference it. <laughs> to kind of like use it as an example to see my argument, right? So what I'm trying to say here is that performativity is a way to understand how do certain kinds of styles, actions, behaviors, enactments become recognizable as such, but then also can be carried forward and then recognizable later. So that when you are in a police academy scene, uh, like scenario training moment, you're in the evaluation as, as what I've described earlier, certain kinds of movement, certain kinds of standing as the recruit to perform command presence, et cetera, needs to, to be done in such a way that it can be uh, recognizable later, right? And recognizable to the evaluator who's grading you because they determine whether or not you pass or fail this one of these 14 scenarios. But more than that, what I'm suggesting is that what happens in that room, like how they see someone die, how they see someone beg for their life. So that's someone being me <laughs> because, you know, I, I have to live as me in my body. And that is the material I carry around with me everywhere. That performance can become performatively important for how that recruit might encounter another deadly use of force scenario or when they might encounter someone that looks like me because some of those recruits for a fact I know you know have gone on to my field site where they are encountering you know Chaldean and Assyrian women women you know who uh, have either just arrived you know from places like Syria or Lebanon or who have you know, lived in Southern California for like a while, you know, um, and that how they learn in that scene to pull their weapon and respond to someone who's in a moment of crisis can be something that follows them as material to cite, as meaning as material to draw from in the field. And for me, that is the kind of, that's like the real consequence of the training is that these models can be carried forward into the field in such a way that they can impact literally whether or not someone's going to live or die. Now, maybe that, maybe that's making it sound like I have more power than, than I think I do, <laughs> but when I'm in the field with these officers and they're talking about their training, they do refer back to it. And they're like, yeah, I remember when I got chewed out, meaning like I, I got I got yelled at for not pulling my gun fast enough or for second guessing, you know, whether or not I should do like the, you know, pull out my my, you know, my duty weapon, like like, like my, my Glock pistol or whether or not I should pull out my taser. And I now I pull out my gun and maybe I don't fire it right away, but I pull out my gun just because I remember that, you know, if like I remember this scene I was in, blah, 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 where like I got in trouble for not pulling it out fast enough. And so it's like these little moments that seem maybe not that important or not, you know, there, there are moments that when you're in the performance, they happen so fast and you're going through so many recruits, but Later when I'm in the field and I'm like listening to these officers and we're spending time together and we're riding through the city on a ride along and I'm watching them pull people over and I'm watching them in a woman's living room, like a Chaldean woman who's like crying and, and like 
you know, she can't speak English well. And basically there, you know, these officers are there to, cause it was a domestic violence call. And uh, the officers were trying to arrest her husband, but she didn't want them to, uh, for, for them to arrest her husband. And she like falls to her knees and begs them. She's like, and she touches one of the officer's boots as a kind of like performance of supplication. She's trying to be like, please, please, you know, she's like supplicating, like, you know, before them saying like, I am not a threat, please stop, please listen to me. And the moment she touches their boots, like they all step back and draw their guns on her. And the moment one person draws a gun, they all draw a gun because they're all, you know, they're all being, they're all sensitive to that action, right? That then creates a kind of, uh, you know, rolling tide of action, right? On this person who clearly needs help and is not a threat and is crying and it doesn't speak English, you know. And so like other times I've been in the academy, I've, I've tried to like embody that. Like what happens if you encounter someone that doesn't speak English? That, that to my knowledge has, uh, in the trainings I've been in, that is not brought up. Actors don't start speak, speaking Spanish or another language, but I've done that when I've role played and people are like, uh, uh, what do I do now? And the evaluator's like, that's a good point. What do you do now recruit? And they're, you know, it's like, I, I, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, and they're like, well, even if they're speaking a different language, you have to get command presence. And so it's, I, I'm bringing this example up to say, this is kind of like where I end with my article, which is like, no matter what I do, <laughs> it's the evaluator in the corner. It's the training officer whose kind of authoritative presence and improvisate, like, no matter what I do, I could beg for my life. I could, and, and trust me, I've had many like evaluators and uh, training officers be like, oh, like you, oh, like you're a good actor. <laughs> like, are you a cop? And I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> and they're like, oh, that was really good. Like, they are not looking at what I'm doing and being like, stop doing that. Stop undermining the training. <laughs> they're like, this is great because it's more real. And then they're like, okay, stop the scene. And, and they'll kind of stop what I'm doing and be like, okay, recruit. So do you see how you should have actually shot this person? Okay, let's do it again. And now shoot them. And then I'm like, you know, I just get shot. It's like, bang, you're dead. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I got to play along. It's a performance, right? I have, we're improvising, you know, but it's always the sort of Basically, the structure of this entire police training is such that even if you, as an actor, are bringing your lived experience to push against the script, the entire structure that we are in has a very sort of strong epistemological foundation that resistances to them inside of them are very, very difficult um, and often like neutralized by the authority of the evaluators who are like, yes, that's very good acting, but you still have to die now. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and this is, you know, I, I say all this and I end my article in this way to say, you know, cause then here's the question about, well, then what do we do? People want to know. Well, but doesn't it matter that like you didn't get shot one time? And I'm like, yeah, I guess, I guess it did matter. Something happened in that moment between this officer and I, but that cannot undo and cannot uh, account for or push back against this, this larger structural problem of how this training is always pointing recruits toward a kind of imagined violence that is racialized, that is gendered, like that, and that kind of awareness and being able to talk about that, that is something that training really can't account for. And it, can't, it doesn't want to account for it because it's, for them, it's what's real. It's like, yeah, no, there are people out there that are going to shoot you. They look like this or they look like this, right? Um, even if they're trying to diversify their training and, and they say, oh, you know, we're all, you know, yes, we want to recognize that all of you are racially diverse, but at the end of the day, who has your back? The Blue family. And we love that you're all so diverse, but we're all diverse under one Blue family. And that Blue family is, a, you know, functions under a kind of tacitly white, masculine, aggressive, 
posturing and performance um, historically and in a contemporary mode, always against communities of color, especially black communities in the US, which in, in which these communities are like the experimental grounds where that training continues to iterate and, and become you know, more violent in figuring out, okay, how can we train better? Because we're literally using these communities as experimental sites, which of course, I don't think officers would say that or the understand uh, that agencies would think of what they do as doing that. But when you're there as an ethnographer, you're like, uh, you see it. And when you do multi-sided ethnography, you can, you're almost like tracing the movements between spaces. Um, and it, it's that tracking that's really important those loops that can get us to see how is it that these racial fantasies and imaginations and performances are becoming material that can be carried somewhere beyond the room. Yeah, and I, I love the article because it, it, and your work in general, because I think it, it just does such a great job of you know, really building the artifice of the ideology and exploring how, as you say, these experiments of white supremacy and structural violence and, you know, policing poverty and all this stuff that we talk about in other contexts are, you know, fit into this dialogue of training and how how they replicate and all this kind of stuff and how they continue to move forward, even as we push against them and try to revise them, they mm -hmm. fix themselves and correct themselves so that it's constantly like, all right, you want to move forward this way? Well, we'll just tweak it this way. And then suddenly, right. <laughs> suddenly we're right back where we were. Right. You're like, okay, right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's that, it's that revision, you know, but, but I, I still want to say like, again, because I get this question a lot and from both like from from multiple places I don't want to say both sides and reinscribe the the like fantasy that there's the, this side and this side uh but the question of like well like what do we do you know um and then well then like should should we even do this work anymore you know if we want to like abolish the police then like we have to stop like let's stop getting funding for doing this kind of work because we're only reinforcing the you know the studying of police and then we're just getting more money and then we're just like therefore like saying yes yes we need the you know and it's like what i think is important or at least like what really drives my own kind of uh, scholarly and like political and like personal mandate to do this work is that when you're in the room, that's, that's where you can see like in a moment exactly how these sorts of things are iterating in a way that if you're just sort of standing outside of it all and, and, and like, I'm not denigrating anyone's scholarship on policing because it's like, I'm only able to do this work because anyone is doing work on policing at all, you know? Um, and like, you can go on ride-alongs and there's been endless ride-along studies. And like, I mean, the entire sort of like foundation of policing studies like came from 1960s, 1970s, sociological works on policing, which were made possible by the ride-along, et cetera, et cetera. That is all valid and important. But being in the room can get you to see how these things iterate in an embodied way. And like, you have to, you watch how people like stand with a performance, how that performance becomes powerful and you feel its weight, you feel its shock. And you're like, right, this isn't shocking because they're trying to get the recruits to feel excitement. This performance is shocking and they are being you know, it's highly emotional because this is what the recruits are tasked with trying to push beyond. Like they're, they're like really trying to like not feel the emotion because they have to like have that command presence. And it's really when you're in the room that you're like, we need to see this <laughs> and we need to see this like together because maybe if officers could see how their own performances are embedded with all of these sort of racialized anti-black fantasies and performances and re-performances, 
then they could see that like a one-off implicit bias training on Tuesday, three months in for five hours is just not going to cut it. <laughs> it's just, it's not. Being in the room and seeing like, this is the launching pad and how these citations can be carried forward to impact someone else's life. You know, even if we're not talking about the extreme example of someone's going to get shot, but like someone's going to get pulled over and they don't speak English well, and they are like being chastised, you know, by an officer for not speaking English well, and they just got to the U.S., you know, and, the, you know, even a, a, a situation that is arguably maybe like less intense than getting shot, right, but is no less impactful for that person, all of these scenarios have within them the possibility for carrying forward these citations. And if we, if we, meaning if we scholars who are committed to abolition and, you know, to a world without police violence or police, you know, want to like make that possible, then I think we have to like sit with sites like this. And this is why like I do the work I do. And this is why I'm not like, you know what, I'm just not going to study police anymore. I'm like, well, someone's going to do it <laughs> and someone's going to be in the room. And it's either going to be another patrol officer that's like 15 years in that's like, you know what, F this. I can't wait to yell at some recruits. It's going to be so fun. You know, it's like, let there be someone else there that's like, well, but what about this? scenario and what about this possibility and how does me enacting this possibility push again push against the logic of this entire thing i don't know <laughs> it's very complicated but right. i thank you for all of your very generous comments uh about the piece <laughs> well, thank you for explaining it to us so uh thoroughly and understandably um it, it was wonderful oh thank uh, you so hey.